Now that's significant. The Market Research Podcast. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on this latest episode of Now That's Significant, a market research podcast. This is your host, Michael Howard, the Head of Marketing at InfoTools. Today, we're joined by Lauren Isaacson, founder of Curio Research, a market and UX research consultancy based in Vancouver, British Columbia, specializing in the green technology sector. Lauren is a researcher with over 20 years experience working as an in-house researcher for various companies and on staff at a number of advertising and research agencies over the course of her career. Now she helps companies improve the experience, accessibility and messaging of their digital products for both the business and consumer sectors. When not generating insights for clients, Lauren takes on leadership roles with the Qualitative Research Consultants Association, or QRCA, an international professional development organization for qualitative researchers across the globe. She currently serves as the organization's vice president and assumes the president's role in September of 2023. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Laura. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You're quite welcome. So, Lauren, what's the most significant thing you're going to tell us today, which we'll unpack throughout the episode? Well, I would really like to discuss making research accessible to people with disabilities. That's a bit of a of a topic that's close to my heart. So, um, so yeah, why don't we go with that? That that sounds a, a very important subject. Do you mind sharing a little bit of background why it is close to your heart? Uh. Well, let's see. It's something that um, it's I just like being able to do the right thing whenever possible. Um, I have had friends who I've worked a lot with in the technology sector, and I've known a lot of people in the UX design space, um, some of whom were really strong advocates for design accessibility. Um, one of those friends who was a very strong advocate for that, uh, she passed for, from cancer a while back. And um, in a way, she kind of inspired this, uh, my, my diving into this topic and being able to kind of lead the conversation of, about accessibility um, that's happening in the design space and how to take that into the research space as well so that those kinds of insights can feed design or can feed business practices. Mm. So why does research need to be accessible? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, there's plain old business reasons, which is um, for one thing, people with disabilities make about 20% of the global population. So by ignoring people with disabilities, you're ignoring a significant portion of the population there. Um, it's also a growing market. So because the global population is aging and as people age, they're more likely to experience a disability. Um, my friend who passed, one of her sayings was, we are all temporarily abled. So every one of us are going, is going to experience some form of disability in some form or another. It could be a temporary disability where we hurt or injured ourselves, um, or it could be a permanent disability where, um, where we, we lose uh, some kind of function as we age. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's also, yeah, sorry, should go no, on. No, can you keep, keep, keep going, please. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also legal reasons to do it. So um, a lot of economically developed countries, such as the United States, New Zealand, um, they have laws requiring products and services to be usable by people with disabilities. So if by not having that, by not uh, including those people in your, your early work in the development stage, you could be in violation of certain um, of certain legal practices uh, when your product finally comes to market. Um, and then, yeah, and so with that, you know, research is often a part of that development process for digital products, but also for any product. Um, so you're doing research to figure out, is it the right design? Um, how does it work the way it needs to work? And those products need to be, should be um, accessible from the very start because trying to make something accessible um, once it is already developed is very expensive. Um, so there's, some, there's a study out there that shows that it can be 10 times as costly to make a product accessible um, if it wasn't built that way to begin with. Uh, and then also, you know, accessible products tend to also have a higher success rate because they're easier for everyone to use regardless of their situation or their ability. So something that's made to operate with one hand, that works really well for someone who 
has only one arm, but it also works really well for someone who's holding a heavy package or a bag of groceries. So think about your cell phone that's typically designed to be operated with one hand. Um, it may not be easy <laughs> if it's not something you're used to, but, uh, but you can do it. So there's a, quite a few products out there that are like that. That's true. And um, you mentioned that 20% of the global population um, are made up with, um, uh, have disabilities and um, not all of those were born with those disabilities either. So there's that quite, uh, quite considerable change in their lifestyle and in their life that, that occurs and um, they need support to help them cope with that, don't they? So research does Absolutely. play a big role in that. Um, so you're primarily a, a qualitative researcher. Um, how do you make sure that your practice is accessible? So there's a few ways that I do that. Um, it's honestly, it's really not that hard. Um, a lot of people are very intimidated by the process of trying to make something accessible because they just they've never looked into it and they don't know. But honestly, it's really not that it's it's really not difficult to be able to do. So for myself, as an example, um, I do my research mostly remotely online. Um, so mostly I'll just use Zoom um, like we're using right now because, um, because Zoom is one of the more accessible um, video conference platforms. So that's really easy for me to do. Um, and, and then I also encourage clients to aim for at least one participant in every group to identify as having a disability. And you be very careful about how you identify that person's having a disability. Um, there are certain ways to like ask or they could reveal information that is um, non-compliant with, uh, with medical information standards. So you need to be like very vague about how you ask that question. But if they identify themselves as having some, uh, some form of disability, you can ask further questions upon that to see like how you can accommodate them. Um, when you identify people with unique needs in the screener, you can reach out to them um, about what their needs might be in the given context of the research. So you can say, well, we're going to be doing this at this facility. This is what it's like there. Here are the different accommodations that they have. Um, are there anything else you need in order to participate in this fully? Or if it's online, it's like this is the platform we're going to be using. Um, are you going to be able to participate in a group context? Would you feel more comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one context? So there are things you can do from there, but you have to know first that that person needs some form of extra accommodation. Um, if someone, if you have to do research in person, uh, you should be prepared to make accommodations for someone who possibly can't come to you. Um, that is definitely an, something that could happen. So you can do a separate interview online, or you can offer to go to them at their residence or a place nearby. You know, get creative. Just be really flexible about what you can do in order to involve that person in the research process. Uh, something you should also do is read up on interaction etiquette before conducting an interview or a focus group with someone who has a disability. So there are a few things that people may not know just just because you know they're not they they don't expose themselves or they haven't had an opportunity to um, to really strongly interact with someone who has some form of disability. Um, a very common faux pas is uh, just assuming someone needs help and going forward and helping them with a situation or a problem without asking them first. Um, you should always ask first, do you need help? How can I help you? And they will instruct you as to whether or not they need that help and how to appropriately help them in a way that isn't demeaning or isn't going to injure them um, in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of um, one of someone quite close to me um, had a stroke um, a while back, and he um, is very um, his attention span. He gets tired very um, very quickly, and so the length of your research um, project with them, your questionnaire, etc., needs to accommodate that as well, doesn't it? Um, For sure. Yeah, that's mm. a very that's that's a common disability is is some form of fatigue where they just can't participate either doing an hour-long interview maybe they can't do the full hour and so then you have to just be really tight with your questionnaire mm. um or um or something of that nature so so yeah that that's definitely something that that you need to be aware of or potentially break it up as well into into chunks um, that's definitely another option yeah mm. 
Um, so how about from a quantitative research perspective, how can you ensure that you are being um, mindful of your accessibility? Well, firstly, and this is always the first step, is asking if the survey software that you're using is compliant with what's known as Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. Um, often these platforms are not. I remember talking with a platform vendor who was demonstrating his new survey product to me, and it seemed really great. But one of the questions I asked was, is this WCAG compliant? And he said, well, no, but I will tell you that I'm colorblind and I can use it. And I'm like, that's not the same thing. So, so uh, can you give us a quick summary of what those um, guidelines oh, are? Oh, gosh, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's things like uh, being obvious, uh, having a distinct um, color formatting um, so that there's there's a really strong... Um, the, so there's a really strong difference between certain colors. And so there are tools out there that will tell you whether or not the colors um, that you're using are have enough of a contrast that people can identify them. Yeah. Um, a very base, another very basic one is the is the system being able to is be compatible with what's known as a screen reader. So when you're blind, you can't see what's on the screen. So you have so you have something in your ear that's like telling you, like the, mm. the it's speaking what is on the page at you, and you'll be able to navigate just using keystrokes yeah. instead of uh, instead of navigating by clicks. So um, so it's a little different, and not every system is compatible with that. Um, also, kind of like opportunities to um, to do to to kind of correct mistakes and do things like that. It's, it can be very simple to very complicated, but there's ways of doing that. Um, so those are some things that okay. that are part of that compliance. We can get a, a link up in the show notes as well, just to share um, some more information on that because I'm sure our listeners will be interested. Um, so any other um, watch outs from a quantitative research perspective? Yeah, um, another thing you can do is you can use simple question formats. So, um, you know, again, let's think about someone who's blind. Um, a blind person using keyboard navigation, you know, the screen reader, like I mentioned before, um, they're not gonna be able to use your drag and drop. So if you if you have a drag and drop put in there, I mean, yeah, sure, that's great. That makes it like more, that might make it a little bit more engaging for, for most of your participants, but for them, you've just suddenly made it impossible to use. So, um, so you want to have just like, just use the simplest question format possible whenever possible. Use ranking format instead, um, something like that. Uh, you can also test your survey uh, using an open source screen reader. There's one called JAWS, J-A-W-S, um, and you can download that and test your survey using that system. Um, Apple products, uh, they're very mindful of accessibility, and so they have screen readers pre-installed on their computing systems. Okay. How do you know that you're um, making progress in terms of research accessibility? Uh, I will know that I have made an impact and that this has this has mattered is when a surveying qual research software, are going to be WCAG compliant by default, where I'm going to be more surprised that something is not compliant versus hearing from somebody that they uh, that they are compliant. I would I would like that to be more of the norm. Um, I'd also like to see incorporating people with disabilities in research to be normalized. Like that's just something that we do every single time. So again, 20% of the population has a disability. And so that means two out of every 10 participants should identify as having some kind of disability. So that's kind of your target right there. Um, and I'd like to also see more researchers with visible disabilities that we can see and that they are participating and that they're part of our community and that they are also um, voiced and heard and and we see them and appreciate them for what they, they bring to the table. Mm. Are you aware of any standards um, that the industry is trying to implement around accessibility? Not that I know of, no. Um, mm. There's a lot of stuff around inclusivity, which can kind of, which can also um, encompass accessibility. Um, but I haven't heard of anything so far that is um, explicitly targeted at research accessibility. 
Mm, I know the um, the Insights Association, Association uh, in the US have their idea um, council, which the A in that is accessibility. So it's really good to see them being very intentional um, in that as well. Yeah, it's great. Mm. Um, so what are organizations, corporates missing out on if they're not being accessible um, with their research? Um, well, I mean, they're missing out on a bit on, um, on, on a business opportunity. So, um, so there's a lot of products out there that are not accessible. Um, you know, like OXO, that, uh, home products company, uh, a lot of their designs were their Well, their, their early designs were made with, um, I think it was the owner's spouse who had severe arthritis. And so a lot of those designs that were made to be just really highly usable and by anyone, you know, extra padded grips on the on the can opener, um, things that were meant to be like stable and like easy to use and very comfortable and feel good in your hand. Not only did that help the owner's spouse with severe arthritis, that also like those were enjoyable designs for everybody else as well. So that was a really great example of something that was made with a specific intention of accommodating someone with a disability that worked really well for someone that, for other, for a wider audience and, and was appreciated for its, its comfort and its, and it's just really awesome design. Um, some other things, like I said, I mean, the legal compliance issue is, is something that I don't think is taken to enough account. Um, it's something that is, I don't know if we peaked, I think we've peaked, but it used to, but um, there were like, we were seeing year over year, like 30% increases in lawsuits um, of websites not being accessible because uh, that's part of the ADA, uh, sorry, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's a, that's a US issue. Um, I am seeing more and more companies starting to become aware of this. Um, you know, I'm in Canada, I'm not in the United States, and I am seeing more people independently come to me specifically and say, how do we make our research programs accessible? Um, can you um, help us with a, with a research study on how to make our facilities more accessible to people with disabilities and how that would work? Um, so those are things that I am seeing more and more of, and I think that's awesome. And But those in reaction to legal compliance, not necessarily because they want to grow their market. And, you know, both things can, those are not incompatible things. Um, both of those, it's, it's great that it's happening regardless. Um, but there are, you know, you can think beyond just, is it accessible? Is it good enough to what, how can we take it a step further? How can we make this thing that is extreme, that is good enough for this person with this disability? Can we make it even easier for them? And in the process also make it easier for everybody else as well. Mm. So reflecting on one of your um, points you made um, just earlier, um, you wanted to see more researchers with um, that have disabilities as well. So being inclusive from a, a market research production perspective, if you will. What are some of the things you think is, have been standing in the way of that um, that need to change in, or, in order for well, that to, to happen? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think now that we are able to do a lot of our, our work online, that means people with mobility issues um, are going to be able to to work from home, are going to be able to, to work from home, um, be able to do this work from either um, from their home and, and not need any not need any like additional accommodations um, for people you know survey research um, we can see more people who have vision issues um, I think that that that's another thing that that we could see more of um, but you know it doesn't stop there um, there's uh, there's all kinds of ways that that people with visible disabilities um, can be accommodated. Um, and then, you know, at conferences, it'd be great if we saw like more inclusivity. I mean, not only from the choice of facility and what accommodations are there, but what if every uh, conference talk also had um, a sign language interpreter attached to it? Um, and 
things of that nature, you know, being able to um, making sure that if people bring a guide dog, that that is that that's there as well. Um, free tickets for um, for people who bring their own sign language interpreter to any kind of any kind of conference or people who um, bring a home health aid um, with them to to any kind of event. I mean, the more we can kind of like make our tent bigger and more we can like say what you need is available. Um, I think that's going to make our our uh, our industry better off. Mm, it's like being representative both in um, who we are and what we do as well. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, um, one thing you mentioned about the um, sign language, um, it was really uh, good to see in New Zealand. I'm not sure how far this extended out into the world as well, but at through our um, COVID briefings um, when we had um, – the Prime Minister um, giving updates, et cetera, they always had a sign language interpreter uh, right next to her at the time. It was really good to see um, that being elevated up. So, Yeah, we uh, our mayor also had same kind of thing, or our provincial, um, I think it was, yeah, I think it was our, uh, um, our the equivalent of, of a governor in the United States, so our premier um, of our province. Uh, there was a sign language interpreter named Nido who was very expressive. He became a meme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. Okay, um, so uh, did you have anything more to share um, on on the topic before I give a, a, a recap of what we've talked about today? Uh, not. I don't think so. I think we're good. But uh, but yeah, we can wrap this up. Very cool. So. Um, if um, we talked about today um, why research needs to be accessible, um, so we covered off that people with disabilities make up 20% of the global population, um, so our research needs to be representative of them, and, and then the practices in terms of data collection need to be um, adapted to that as well in order to ensure that they are um, in our research as well and that we can, as companies make decisions based on um, the total population, not just um, a limited well majority that can uh, can actually uh, are able uh, or don't have those disabilities. Um, we talked about global uh, population aging as well, so um, and who are more likely to experience a disability as well. Um, some people go through some quite significant changes in their in their lifestyle, so uh, market researchers need to be ahead of that, um, and then helping inform companies on how they can adapt their digital products or physical products at the same time as well and services um, to meet their needs as well. Um, you, so we talked about um, as a qualitative research, some of the things that we can do to, to help ensure our practices accessible. Um, so a lot of online um, tools, Zoom is quite good as well in terms of face-to-face um, -face, um, in a digital sense. Um, we um, talked about screeners, um, being careful not to be too um, direct and um, asking um, for what disabilities uh, people may have, um, because there are some health and privacy issues that you need to be aware of. Um, so you do need to be mindful of, of that there. Um, ideally, we will have a, a good um, spread of people in our um, samples, et cetera, as well. Um, two in 10 people, um, ideally, um, should have some form of disability in our, in our groups as well, um, just to ensure that we are capturing all of the needs as, as we can. Um, and again, to have that representation in there. Um, some things from a quantitative research perspective, um, ensuring that um, if we're using online, um, the software is web content um, accessible um, guidelines so it's um, compliant with those there use simple questions um, and also test out your survey using open source screen readers as well so um, it should you should be able to listen to it audibly um, and understand and be able to easily navigate through that as well um, with those screen readers um, and we also touched on how we'll know if our research is, um, is making progress in terms of accessibility as well. So there will be that um, WCAG compliance by default. Um, there will be um, 
incorporating more people with disabilities in our research. That will be a normalised thing. Um, and then we'll also hopefully see um, more representation from a workforce perspective in the market research industry as well. Um, I believe that was all. Any Any final thoughts there? No, I just hope that this is something that everybody incorporates into their practice. No, that's right. And it, it's beyond the, the commercial side of things. It, it is just the right thing to do as well, isn't it? We want to we want to hear and understand like the whole of society, not just a, a portion of it. So. For sure. Mm. So thank you very much for joining us on the show today, Lauren. Thank you for having me. All right. And if you do want to hear more about um, research accessibility, you can um, visit uh, the Curio Research blog, um, which will be linked in our show notes. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us on the episode today. If you did like what you've heard, um, feel free to subscribe to the podcast, share it with others, uh, or leave a review as well. We'd be very grateful. So thank you for listening to Now That's Significant.